Dr. Komarov, it's been more than a year now since the COVID uh, pandemic started. And it seems that when people are first infected by the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, the symptoms can be so different from one person to the next. Why is that? Well, that's right, Ovid. Uh, the symptoms can range from absolutely no symptoms to death. So that's a pretty wide range. Why is it such a wide range? Uh, it can depend on a number of factors. For instance, the amount of virus that enters your body whether you have inherited genes that make you vulnerable to this virus, whether you have uh, other chronic illnesses that make you vulnerable to the virus, um, the quality of the medical care you get. So there is a wide range of things that, that explains why the symptoms can be so different. And it sounds, that, uh, sounds like some people really uh, do not recover from COVID at the time that you'd expect them to. Um, what are those uh, symptoms of what we call long COVID? Yeah, that's right. Um, the paradox of this illness is that some people who are super sick at the beginning of the illness recover, many of them, to perfect health. But others who are not that sick um, including those who are not that sick at the beginning, go never really fully get back to normal, that they are left with a lingering set of symptoms that seriously interfere with their ability to function at work or at home. And that condition is what's being called long COVID. Hmm. And, and how does long COVID last? What can we expect in terms of the duration of uh, uh, of, of those symptoms? Well, you know, because long COVID is so new, COVID is so new, we don't really know yet. What we know that may be relevant is that debilitating chronic illnesses can follow other kinds of infections and that those lingering illnesses can last months or even years. So I'm afraid I think it's quite possible that long COVID will last uh, months and possibly years. Hmm. Well, that's gonna have a, uh, a long lasting impact. Uh, how many people do you estimate uh, would develop uh, the long COVID and will not really fully recover um, as a result of, of the first infection? In the United States, um, we estimated last summer that the pandemic might produce 2.5 million cases of long COVID. Now, that was based on pretty conservative assumptions. And I'm afraid now in early 2021, they look too conservative. For instance, in the last half of 2020, many more people developed COVID than was originally projected. So I think the 2.5 million is, um, is a, probably a bottom case estimate. As for um, the economic consequences of this, uh, two um, fine economists here at Harvard, Larry Summers and uh, David Cutler, estimate that the direct and indirect costs to the US economy from just the chronic illnesses that follow COVID are going to range over $4 trillion in the next decade. And that's just the cost of the chronic illnesses that we're talking about today. If you add in the costs of the original hospitalization, all of the acute medical care, the costs are going to be as great as $16 trillion over the next uh, decade. Those are, so, those are really know, staggering numbers. Yeah, if, if the numbers come anywhere as close to these projections, Houston, we have a problem. Wow. And I know that you've, you've been following um, the outcomes of viral infections for, for many years now. It seems that uh, what you just described as long COVID um, is not an entirely new phenomenon. It is actually very similar to other conditions uh, such as myalgic encephalomyelitis or, or ME, um, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and those have been around as you described them uh, in other situations uh, long before COVID. 
Um, can, you, can you tell us more about uh, the similarities uh, to other diseases that you've seen in the past? Sure. Uh, long COVID is very much like the illness, uh, as you say, Ovid, called ME or chronic fatigue syndrome. The abbreviation is MECFS. Um, that's an illness that was first described in the 19th century, maybe even earlier than that. It often occurs in young, previously healthy people, and it often follows an infectious illness of some sort. People are left with months or years of debilitating fatigue, brain fog, aching muscles, headaches, disrupted sleep, inability to exercise, a flu that never ends. It's, it's very similar to what's seen in long COVID. And I think, as I said, it's likely that following a number of different infections, the same lingering post-infectious fatiguing illness can occur. Uh, in the United States, before the COVID pandemic, there were about 2.5 million people with uh, MECFS. So if the projections, the conservative projections of another 2.5 million cases of long COVID proved to be true, that means that the population of people with these lingering post-infectious illnesses is gonna double in the next year or two in the United States. Uh, and do we know more about the causes um, for this, those symptoms of long COVID and maybe uh, that the history of what we've learned from um, ME or CFS uh, could they help us understand um, what causes long COVID? Well, that's, that's the big question. <clears throat> and the big answer is we don't know yet. Uh, but we do have theories, uh, theories that are based on pretty substantial evidence. Um, I think most people in this field think that both MECFS and long COVID, the symptoms are caused primarily by brain abnormalities that include an activation of the immune system in the brain or neuroinflammation, um, autoantibodies or an autoimmune disease that causes autoantibodies that attack targets in the brain, um, decreased blood flow to the brain caused by abnormalities of the autonomic nervous system, part of the nervous system that controls blood flow, blood pressure, pulse rate. Um, and then finally, uh, by an abnormality in the failure of cells in the brain to produce enough energy molecules to meet the needs of the brain. All of those things have been documented in MECFS and are likely to apply to long COVID as well. Hmm. So, so what are the implications for, for care and treatment? Uh, what would you suggest uh, to people who are now experiencing long COVID in terms of improving um, the level of function or symptoms? Well, it, you know, it's certainly there have not yet been any serious uh, trials of treatments for long COVID. Uh, it's just too early. Some are underway. Um, my bias is that until we better understand the underlying biology of long COVID, we're not gonna have effective treatments. At least what we need are an understanding of the mechanisms of what's causing the illness in order to have targets to shoot at with therapies. Uh, but the new investment uh, by the NIH and CDC, I think is likely to provide some answers and some targets for therapy. Uh, in the next couple of years. Hmm. And in the meantime, what, what do you think is the kind of support uh, that is needed to, first of all, care uh, for people with long COVID, but also to, uh, to do the kind of research that you just talked about, um, uh, ultimately to get to effective treatments? What do we need to have in place? Well, enormous support, uh, both for patient care and research. And fortunately, the COVID relief bill that was passed in December includes a, a lot of funding for research. And many academic medical centers around the country, including ours, 
are in the process of setting up clinics for long COVID, um, clinics not only to provide patient care, but to enroll patients in studies of long COVID. In addition, private foundations like yours, Solve ME, are also providing support and doing a critically important job of engaging and involving the community of patients uh, in the process of defining the research questions that are most important. Um, one of the things that I think you have done, your organization has done that, that's most important is uh, creating this registry of patients, both patients with ME-CFS, but also patients with long COVID now, and an app uh, uh, that allows patients to report their experience with the illnesses as often as they choose. That sort of collection of data in real time uh, will be an enormous boon to clinical research on both of these illnesses. Um, you know, the research questions to pursue, in my mind, are, are many. Uh, if, you, if I were king, uh, my top two would be first to study very carefully what lasting damage may be done in some people to the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, the brain, which are the main organs that are attacked at the beginning of the illness. In many people, I think no lasting damage has been done, but in others, there is gonna be lasting damage and we need to understand what it is, how badly it affects a person's function and how to prevent it. And then the second question is, I alluded to earlier, what's going on in the brain with the immune system of the brain, with the autonomic nervous system, with energy metabolism that may be causing the symptoms of the illness. When we understand that, we're gonna have uh, therapeutic targets that I think will make people better. Well, Dr. Komarov, thank you so much for, uh, for your, your comments. And I hope that next time um, we will get together to talk about uh, the results of uh, some of those uh, studies that you just mentioned, and hopefully we'll be able to discuss uh, some treatments that can benefit uh, other people who are now still struggling to recover from COVID-19. I hope you're right, and I look forward to that, Oleg.